Welcome back to LeMaster Tech YouTube, and I am super excited to be bringing you lesson one in an eight-part crash course on an introduction to controls and automation engineering. You can see the eight-part course format here, and today's episode is obviously the introduction to controls and automation engineering. This should give you a really good understanding of a lot of the fundamentals of the field. And by the end of this course, you should have an excellent understanding of what controls and automation is. You should also be pretty familiar with what industry and companies would be looking for these skills and trades. Be equipped to know whether getting into a career in this field or an education in this field is something that would interest you. And lastly, you should feel very equipped to know the right ways to get more information if you're curious in pursuing this field further. So for episode one, introduction to controls and automation engineering today, what we're gonna cover is what controls and automation engineering is, key tools and technologies, as well as some lingo that you'll need to know, the biggest industries that need automation, average salary ranges you can expect, and in every single episode in this course, I'm going to talk about some free and very cheap resources that you can explore for learning more about this field and engineering in general. So if you're completely new to the field, in just a few sentences, what is controls and automation engineering? In my words, it's the field of engineering pertaining to improvements to a process by increasing throughput and manufacturing speed, increasing safety and system reliability, or both. And this is most commonly achieved by writing code for a dedicated industrial computer known as a programmable logic controller or PLC that controls input and output devices referred to as IO and often interfacing with the engineers and operators through a human machine interface or HMI. There's a little bit of industry lingo in there, but the essence of it is we make things faster, higher quality, or safer. And ideally, we would do all three. So, bit of a funny meme here, um, but I think it's actually super applicable. A controls and automation engineer most commonly is not something you go to school for at least not specifically for. You have to have enough mechanical or chemical knowledge to be able to be helpful in the process that you're automating, but you also have to have enough electrical engineering knowledge that you'll know what you're doing with a panel design schematic, but you're also gonna have to be enough of a software developer, computer science engineer, to be able to write some functional, elegant, easy to read and easy to debug PLC code. And on top of all of that, you're gonna need to dip your toes in the IT field of knowing a little bit about industrial networking. And it's not that you have to enter the field with all of these skills, but you should enter the field with some of them and be ready to learn the rest of them. So some of the key technologies and tools of the trade, words that you will absolutely need to be familiar with if you have any interest in getting into this field or knowing about the field. The programmable logic controller, the P PLC. There are definitely some industries moving towards an industrial PC, which is just like a really robust computer running Windows sometimes, or even some smaller automation systems now relying on microcontrollers like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino if it's a really simple application. But far and away, the industry standard for years and years and likely continuing for years and years to come is the programmable logic controller. There are so many manufacturers of PLCs, the biggest ones, and if you're in the US, the ones you'll almost certainly get exposed to at some point, Allen Bradley, Rockwell, ABB. Those are kind of three of the giants, but there are so many companies that make PLCs as well. Mitsubishi, Panasonic, Wago, um, to name a few, there's, there's more. And so a PLC is a specific type of computer optimized for high reliability, synchronous programming, meaning time-cycled code, and converting commands to electrical signals to control devices known as outputs and read electrical signals back from devices known as inputs. Specific programming languages exist to write code for these PLCs. The most common two and the two that you should have on your radar right off the bat are ladder logic and structured text. Ladder logic looks a lot like relays and kind of an electrical based programming language. It's very visual. It's like a flow chart um, that combines programming concepts with electrical concepts. And structured text is somewhere between like a C++, C Sharp, Python hybrid, more of a traditional programming language to where people with a software background often feel more comfortable writing in structured text. People with a mechanical or electrical background often pick up ladder logic. But to talk a little more about input and output devices, there are really only two types of input and output devices here, and I'm simplifying, but this is a crash course. Digital inputs and outputs are also known as discrete, Boolean, on-off, binary, 
think just a simple light switch, an on off light switch where the light bulb turns on or turns off. It's only two states and examples of this in the field could be a start stop pump or motor, a valve that is open or close and information back like a light that is either on or off, a push button that is either pressed or not pressed, discrete, digital, on off or analog inputs and outputs, AKA variable range, zero to a hundred percent, position control. And for this, you can think of like a dimmer switch in your home where there's a zero to a hundred percent setting and the variable range is known as analog. So in process, the most common ones you might see for inputs are like temperature sensors, flow sensors, pressure sensors. And the most common outputs you might see are like uh, pumps that can ramp up in speed known as variable frequency drives or motors that have adjustable speed parameters or zero to hundred percent open control valves and a lot of devices now are smart enough to actually use an advanced communication protocol like ethernet ethercat profinet modbus tcp ip just to name a few there are a lot of others but even when you boil it down if they are talking over those advanced communication protocols the end devices you're interfacing with still typically fall into either digital or analog. In determining what type of IO you have and how many total points you have, typically is one of the key drivers in a lot of the hardware decisions you'll make in a project. And one of the last huge things you need to be aware of is the human machine interface or HMI. Some very simple systems might be controllable just from a few push buttons or indicator lights and not actually require custom graphics to be made, but the vast vast majority of automation systems are going to require well-designed, simple, and easy to use HMI graphics. Software developers and people with a programming background might think of these as GUIs or graphical user interfaces, but in the industry world, because you're controlling machines, the phrase human machine interface or HMI is typically used more often. And these can range from simple displays with a few buttons or device statuses to super complicated plant overviews with thousands of data points being pulled back in. A standalone HMI, a very simple display, could be used to control one piece of equipment, sometimes called a skid, but a complicated graphical display environment with embedded trending and alarms and security is typically going to fall more in the category of a SCADA or supervisory control and data acquisition system. Which brings us to the supervisory control and data acquisition system. Plus, we're gonna talk about the whole automation pyramid thing. This is kind of a very important concept that's really a lot of jargon, but it does actually hold true for the industry. Supervisory control and data acquisition system, more commonly called a SCADA, is like a blend of the HMI that allows operators to interface and control with devices, but also like a corporate software tool that can pass data up to a data aggregation system. But what you need to know about the automation pyramid is basically every control system has the lowest two levels, the field level, meaning devices that are being controlled and giving you feedback, and the control level, which is like where your PLCs and smart devices and switches and networking live. And then very often a plant or a system will stop at the supervisory level. So a SCADA might be as high as a plant goes. Not everyone has an ERP controlling production and not everyone has an MES for data aggregation, but that is technically the automation pyramid. That's enough about that for now. Let's move on. Other things to keep on your radar, we're not gonna do a deep dive in episode one, but industrial networking standards and protocols are very important. Basics of servers, operating systems, and computer to computer communications are super important as well. Industrial control panel design and electrical schematics, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but that is guaranteed to come up in a career as an automation engineer. Data reporting and logging, historian, SQL database, creating Power BI reports and trends, these types of things are also super important. And there's so much more, but not for lesson one. So now you know a little bit about what it is, but is this in demand? Where could you work if you did this? And I honestly encourage you, if you're curious about that, to spend a little time on LinkedIn or just Google poking around and seeing if your favorite companies need an automation engineer. Because if you just type in blank company, automation and controls engineer, odds are something is gonna pop up. They're very in demand, and because it's a slightly more niche field of engineering, if you have some of these skills, 
a lot of the time you can get an interview and get your foot in the door with some pretty big companies pretty quickly. While most of the time this job is not gonna be fully remote, there are definitely a lot of hybrid opportunities out there in pretty much every city in the world and every company in the world to some extent that does manufacturing or anything industrial will need some automation and controls engineering. So if you're heading to school and you're thinking about getting in this field or you're an undecided major of engineering and you're thinking about going to this field, should you go specifically for controls and automation engineering, I would actually say not really. It's just my advice and you do not have to take it, but I think getting a mechanical engineering degree, an electrical engineering degree, a computer science degree, a broad field of engineering degree, and focusing on electives, school projects, and internships or co-ops that help get you in this direction is actually probably going to be better for you in the long run than looking for a hyper-focused degree like controls and automation engineering. I'm not saying you won't love the field of controls and automation engineering, but I am trying to say that a mechanical engineer who wants to get into controls can usually do it. A controls engineer who wants to go be a mechanical engineer can't usually just make that switch. And most places are looking for individuals with a four-year engineering degree for their automation and controls engineering roles, but they're usually very open as to what specific engineering discipline those people have. And they're far more focused on finding driven and motivated individuals with some practical on-hand knowledge. So if you are an automation and controls engineer, what can you kind of expect your career path to look like? And the two most common types of controls and automation engineer are either an integrator or an internal resource to a company. And an integrator is essentially an engineering contractor. There are a lot of companies that don't have the internal resources to do large scale automation upgrades and projects on their own. So companies like Rovasys, my first job, uh, and other similar companies will be called into a big factory to do a large automation project. Integration can be very intense. It's project driven. So a lot of the time there will be slower periods as you develop systems in the office and then very intense periods of travel and long hours as you commission systems on site. But these organizations are often very focused on controls and automation and they promote from within. So if your main goal is to rise to the top of a company, you might want to look for a company that is primarily engineers doing what you're doing because your odds of making it to manager, director, senior levels are probably better at an integrator. But on the flip side, as an internal resource, there's often a much smaller team of automation and control controls engineers. A lot of the time that comes with larger responsibility or more people looking to you to take on whole system ownership. At my second company, I was one of two controls engineers and the only one on site. So anytime an opportunity for automation or controls arose, it was on my shoulders. This was a mix of awesome responsibility and quite a bit of stress. But these organizations could be larger and much broader than just an automation firm. And for that reason, you could get tied up in your career path in layers of bureaucracy and find yourself kind of stalled as a senior engineer, unable to move into management or break any higher because you're at a company that does a lot of different things, not just automation. So now let's take a look at salaries and typical controls and automation engineering salaries. I want to caveat this with, I am talking about US-based. I don't have a good understanding of the international salary ranges and how they vary. If you've had a wildly different experience, higher or lower, let me know about in the comments below. So most interns and co-ops in this position are finding paid internships. They're kind of on the low end, the Midwest, maybe the lower markets for this field might find 16, 17, the high teens per hour, but there are internships paying in the high 20s as well. So most new full-time hires right out of school with an engineering degree doing automation and controls engineering can expect to be around the $70,000 benchmark. There are definitely companies hiring higher than that, sort of right on par with the average of most engineering disciplines right now in the US. Once you're in the middle of your career and you've been technical for five to ten years, you can kind of know you're at a decent spot right now if you're around the $90,000 mark. Now as you get kind of beyond the 10 plus years, there's kind of two paths at this point. You've entered management and you're like an engineering manager or director or you're still technical like as a senior or lead engineer. Technical resources typically just make less money than management resources. That's the nature of industry. But even as a technical resource, once you're in kind of 
deep into your career, 10 or more years, you should be finding yourself into six figures in 2024. I consistently found that mid-career controls and automation engineers were averaging around $110,000. And this is where the ranges start to get really wide. And of course, if you're an engineering manager or director, you can expect to be outpacing that a little bit. Again, some things like stock incentives and bonuses cannot really be captured in these numbers, but if you're in management and automation controls engineer, you can expect that you'll be doing pretty well. But kind of a truth of engineering is that you'll do very well for yourself and it's not a path to instant and immediate riches. So it's a great salary, it's a good field option, but it might not be the single highest earning field that you could go into. And so that pretty much wraps up episode one, Introduction to Controls and Automation Engineering. And I want to finish every single episode in this course with some free and cheap ways to learn more about the field. I have to first plug the Real Pars YouTube channel. It's kind of funny as a YouTube channel to tell you to go watch a different YouTube channel, but they have so many short videos on just individual concepts of controls and automation engineering. Almost their entire page is dedicated to controls. They have really compelling animations. They're not sponsoring the channel. I'm not being asked to plug them or anything. Um, they're just a really good YouTube channel. And if you search anything like what is a PLC, they're probably gonna be the top or one of the top results. I really like the Real Pars YouTube channel. And secondly, I wanna recommend brilliant.org. And this one isn't just for controls and automation engineers. It is a really fun, really enjoyable app that helps you learn about all fields of engineering, sciences, math. I personally download it and subscribe to Brilliant right before my last round of interviews and my last career change. And it helped me so much in getting ready for the interviewing process. Because being an automation and controls engineer requires a broad understanding of many fields of engineering, Brilliant is the perfect partner to sponsor this automation and controls crash course. So thank you to Brilliant. Be sure to check out the Real Pars YouTube channel and brilliant.org linked below this video. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Be on the lookout for the rest of the episodes in this crash course. As always, be sure to let me know what you'd like to see more of on the channel in the comments below. I will see you next time. Good luck with your projects. Thanks for watching. Bye.